What's going on everybody, Boris here at the Ecology Design Studio. Today we're delving into the world of physics and we'll take a look at electric charge. What is it, how do we come by that name, and what its significance in the world of physics? First we'll cover the basics. Uh, electric charge is a fundamental conserved property of some subatomic particles, which determines their electromagnetic interactions. It's based on the concept of quantum spin, which is a vector quantity that has both magnitude and direction. Spin can be represented by a vector whose length is measured in units of the Planck constant, h bar. So here we have two particles, one positive and one negative. We can think of them as a proton and an electron. Um, the first example here is 230 kilometers per hour due north. The first part uh, is the speed, the magnitude, due north is the direction h bar is a very small number it's about 6.2626 times 10 to the negative 34th that's 10 with uh, 34 zeros behind it and it basically if you look at the units its area it's the force per area so kilograms mass uh, per meter squared per second which is uh, acceleration so it's a, in a sense it's a force factor uh, and let's delve into the basics of uh, subatomic particles uh, and by that I mean the, part, the many particles we have to deal with in physics. We go from an electron to a fermion to a lepton to a boson to a quark and a hadron and on and on and on. Uh, it seems like every week there's a new particle and it really does seem like a big joke sometimes. And I can sympathize with, uh, with those who feel that way. My personal view is that we don't yet fully grasp the nature of particle mechanics and particle physics just yet, which is why we have a, a million different names for a million different particles. The grand unification theory uh, is non-existent at the moment, but I have my hopes, um, though I won't be holding my breath. So we have several particles. We have hadrons, baryons, gluons, leptons, fermions, and quarks on the exotically named side, and protons, neutrons, and electrons on the side with which we're most familiar. So let's break it down step by step. Uh, I've got another video uh, that deals with subatomic particles and with star formation and with the evolution of stars. If you'd like to take a look at that, it goes more in depth into some of the terminology. Uh, but uh, we're going to jump in and just the, the basic definitions to get, to get an understanding of what those names mean and what kind of particles they're talking about. So what's a hadron? A hadron is a composite particle made up of quarks. And quarks are the smallest subatomic unit that is the building block of neutrons and protons. Uh, and other such particles. Uh, ne neutron is a neutral atomic particle and proton is a positive atomic particle. We'll see why in a minute. Protons and neutrons are both hadrons and they're composed of three quarks. Uh, thus hadrons, the definition of hadrons, is a particle that is composed of three quarks, three small building blocks. Uh, this makes them baryons. Uh, a baryon is a specific subclass of hadrons and it deals with a specific number of quarks. So a baryon is a, a, a three-part type, uh, a, a three-particle uh, subatomic particle. So a proton, proton composed of three quarks is both a hadron and a baryon. All hadrons, including baryons, obey the strong force. The strong force is the interaction that binds protons and neutrons together in the nuclei of atoms. It's mediated by gluons, which is another subatomic particle believed to bind quarks together. Now electrons are negatively charged particles and are not composed of any subparticles. That means they're not composed of quarks. That makes them leptons, and leptons do not obey the strong force. Does that mean that the strong force is related to quarks? Uh, probably, but unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that question. Now then, let's change gears and consider a particle called... Uh, ooh, particle. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. A principle called the Pauli Exclusion Principle. Uh, it's named after the accomplished physicist um, Wolfgang Pauli. It states that no two identical fermions may occupy the same quantum state simultaneously. So then, what's a fermion? It's a particle with a half energy spin, um, so with a value of one, one half or 0.5. Both quarks and leptons are fermions. Looking back to our definitions, we see that 
to their definitions of leptons and hadrons, we see that this includes electrons and particles comprised of uh, quarks like neutrons. So why is this important? Is there an application for this knowledge? And indeed there is in the field of astrophysics. This helps us understand why white dwarfs, suns, and neutron stars do not collapse in on themselves and become black holes. In white dwarfs, atoms are held apart by electron degeneracy pressure. In neutron stars, which are subject to even stronger gravitational forces, electrons have merged with protons to form neutrons and are thus held apart by neutron degeneracy pressure. Let's take a look at how repulsion and uh, attraction occurs between regular uh, positive and negative particles. So say for example we have an object and in that object we have four particles, two positive and two negative. There's going to be a repulsion between like particles. Opposites attract, uh, similars retract, or similars... I forgot the saying. <laughs> but basically we have a repulsion occurring between the positive particles and the negative particles and an attraction occurring between the positive and negative particles so in this region here where the repulsion happens we get uh, a sort of a push back the, the particles go in the opposite direction and this creates um, pressure if you will or um, pressure out this is counterbalanced by the attraction of opposite particles so when these two particles repulse, these two positive particles repulse each other, this particle might be sent closer to this negative particle and be captured and, and form a bond. But what I'm trying to get at here is that this is not um, comparable to electron degeneracy pressure or neutron degeneracy pressure. This is related to the principle we examined previously uh, called the, the Pauli exclusion principle. This allows us to realize two things. Our own star, the Sun, does not collapse on itself not just because of the strong nuclear reactions occurring in its core, that force is insufficient. And as we can see, as we saw in this diagram, we have a counterbalance. We have positives uh, repulsing positives, negatives repulsing positives, or negatives repulsing negatives, but we have positives and negatives attracting uh, and drawing closer together. So for every push, there's also a pull. Now, our star does not collapse because of the previously mentioned electron degeneracy pressure um, tied to the Pauli exclusion principles. Stars don't collapse because electrons have a half energy spin and are just fermions, and fermions cannot occupy the same quantum state at the same time. So you, have to have an, so you can't have an electron within an electron. Basically, stars stay stars because there's no room to condense the electrons uh, given the insufficient weight of the outer layers of the star. But when that weight does become sufficient, electrons find a place to go, into protons, creating neutrons. Now we have a neutron star, and it stays apart because, of neutro because neutrons are also fermions, and they can't be in the same place at the same time. Uh, quarks, the building blocks of protons and neutrons, have a spin of one half. Uh, thus a half energy. This could be either positive or negative. So how do we get a proton? We have three quarks in a proton, two of them with a spin positive one half and one with a spin of minus half. So the end result is a plus one minus 0.5 le leaving a positive half spin value behind making protons positive. This is a very crude explanation, but it gets the job done. Uh, and it also gets us into thinking of how are neutrons neutral. Uh, if they're composed of three quarks, which they are, uh, then we have an odd number of particles or, or an odd number of building blocks and we'll always end up with either a positive or a negative spin value no matter how we arrange and combine uh, the different quarks inside that particle. Well, neutrons... Uh, are basically a proton with an electron in it. That's another very crude definition. I wouldn't quote that. Uh, but an electron has a spin of negative one half and a proton has a spin of positive one half. Uh, so when the, the pressure or when the weight of a star is sufficient enough to push um, those particles together, it creates a, a neutron star. And it, it's neutral because 
the, the positive half of the proton and the negative half of the electron cancel each other out. We can see now that the concept of charge is based on quantum spin, which is a fundamental property of some subatomic particles and can really be called anything because when we talk about charge, we're talking about spin, a property, and not an independent force or particle on its own. Uh, a bit of fun history, uh, the concept of charge, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but the concept of charge was first uh, contemplated by Thales of Miletus, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, around 600 BC. C.F. Dufay proposed that electricity comes in two varieties that cancel each other out back in 1733. And uh, it's arbitrary which polarity is called positive and which is called negative. I'll leave you with a fun fact. Positive charge can be defined as the charge left on a glass rod after rubbing it with silk. So let me know your thoughts. Do you get excited about physics or do you feel that the many names uh, and particles with similar names get in the way of dialogue between scientists and us, the general public? Thanks for watching, folks, uh, and I'll see you next time on an Ecology Designs production.